Uh, hey, so it's uh, 420, and even though I have a German last name, I don't speak German, but one of the Germanic things I do like to do is start relatively on time, um, so we can end on time and get out of here. Um, so hi, I'm Brian Bellendorf. Uh, I'm, I, I work for the Linux Foundation, uh, and one of the two things I do is I serve as CTO for the Open Wallet Foundation, um, which launched just over a year ago, I, I, and it's um, focused on this domain of I, I really, you know, you all have Apple Pay and Google Wallet on your phones. You have other things that look and behave a little bit like wallets. Um, I, I, you know, I mentioned at the keynote. I, I, some, if you, if any of you are members of a zoo or a museum or other things, often they'll try to convince you to download their app so that you can use a QR code to enter in the future. Well. It's kind of silly to spray this stuff out over all these different different apps, right? And require us to have to have apps just for these like single credentials, right? Um, and so the Open Wallet Foundation uh, was really started to be a neutral home for open source uh, projects that would support the development of interoperable wallets. Um, and uh, uh, this wallet domain, I, I mean, it's. You know, if you compare it to things like web browsers or email, um, which is what many of us really do want to see this become, kind of like the third kind of personal information management tool on anybody's phone or devices or things like that. Um, comparing the history of this, imagine what the web would have been like if there hadn't been a mosaic. If we were trying to scale the web up um, using the original www.app that Tim Berners-Lee wrote for the next machine, um, which none of you know about, and that's good, um, uh, or, or uh, using Lynx, which was a text mode client, um, uh, uh, Mosaic achieved a certain degree of notoriety and attention and a way of doing things long before policymakers took took notice, or, 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 or most businesses took notice, right? Um, I, I, and then Netscape Navigator came along and, you know, all the history. Um, uh, with mail clients, uh, we uh, had, you know, uh, open source mail clients that achieved just enough traction uh, to be able to say, this is the right way to do it, right? Interoperability, talking uh, protocols like, like SMTP for sending emails and, and IMAP, POP initially, and then IMAP for talking to mail servers, and we got decentralization that way. Um, but with wallets, we've kind of bootstrapped ourselves into an ecosystem that uh, is still a series of mostly walled gardens. Um, sure, you, you might be able to pull your ticket for a United flight over to Google Wallet, right, uh, or Apple Pay, um, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, uh, but uh, but these still feel very 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 much like like uh, AOL versus CompuServe again for for the old people in the room. Um, uh, and uh, recent trends have been uh, kind of leading to a lot of organizations realizing we should really put some resources in a different direction towards this. One of those uh, trends has been governments realizing that if we're going to get to digital equivalents for paper documents that you use every day, like driver's licenses or, or uh, social security cards uh, or diplomas or other things. I'm sure all of you have had the experience of having to like scan or take a picture of a paper document and sending that in in order to be able to get a visa uh, or to, you know, doesn't it feel like, like silly? It's like there's heuristics that are used to try to figure out if that's a legitimate document. Why aren't these digitally signed, native, uh, digitally native first uh, types of entities, right? Um, and so, uh, and for 20 years, there's been uh, work on the standards to make this stuff work. Uh, but it's finally time to build code. And one of the um, trends that, that has led towards this are governments starting to publish uh, things like uh, here in, um, well, not here, but, but just north of here in British Columbia, the, 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 the government of British Columbia has been building uh, use cases that involve um, identity documents uh, around uh, education, around permits for, believe it or not, mines and other kind of natural resource management. Um, and they, uh, uh, actually, the, the British Columbia government funded the development of a library of applications um, uh, hosted by originally the Hyperledger Foundation, another Linux Foundation project, under the, the name Aries, uh, and that got open sourced, and that has been a kind of, it helps set the stage for, well, something like this is possible. And it really does um, uh, uh, hinge on this premise of instead of everything interesting about you sitting in a profile on a remote server somewhere, uh, instead saying everything interesting about you is held in your hands in a wallet, and you are the pivot point for information exchange, right? And, and uh, you're issued these credentials and you present them over here, not what some other remote site said about you. Um, and this shouldn't be something that just applies to um, uh, uh, passports and the like. Think about when you look at somebody's profile on LinkedIn um, and they claim they went to Harvard, right? Um, if they're applying for a job at your company, 
Um, maybe you're lucky enough to be able to, 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 to know somebody at Harvard and they can check the roles, or maybe you go to the website and see, you know, are they, did they actually graduate in, you know, 2006 or whatever. Um, but that's a very high cost kind of thing, right, to validate somebody's claims on this front. Um, digital diplomas would make it easy to, to attest to this and make it easy not just for the consumer to, to, to keep this straight and, and upload it and quickly, uh, but easy for the verifier as well, right? And wallets are the hinge in that exchange. Um, and so getting wallets right is super important. Um, you might have heard of the concept of self-sovereign identity or user-centric identity. That's also been a domain of, of research and work and a lot of the development of protocols. And all this has come together now at a point where we're ready to actually deploy this stuff in mass, from the collection of standards, the collection of pilots that has led to this. And a really big event happened last month in Europe. Um, after a couple of years of work in this domain, the European uh, Commission, uh, or sorry, European Union passed a law uh, that says uh, we're going to move to digital uh, driver's licenses uh, and other digital documents. Um, we're going to fund the development of uh, a bunch of large-scale pilots to show that this is uh, working. And in fact, those, those pilots have already started. Uh, and um, they started last year. They funded $22 million to build a reference implementation of a wallet. And the mandate that passed last month was now all 22 member states of, the, of Europe have to now provide wallets for their citizens to be containers for these uh, national IDs. Uh, this is obviously a good thing because you can imagine how hesitant a European country would be to tell you, here's your um, uh, digital, uh, you know, uh, 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 digital diploma or digital birth certificate, and now you have to hold it in either Google or Apple's uh, software, right? Um, I, I, that was one reason they decided to fund this. The second, though, is everybody is interested in interoperability in this space, and not just interoperability within a country, which you could get from a walled garden kind of app, but interoperability for use cases that span countries, right? when you're applying for a visa or you're applying for a job in a remote country, that kind of thing. We have to talk about interop that looks a lot more like the interoperability of email and the web uh, than looks like um, uh, the way that governments typically write software. So all of this is coming together at the right time, and that's why the Open Wallet Foundation uh, was formed. Um, we are, as you would expect of any Linux Foundation project, 100% an open source project. Um, we've got a, a repository with a bunch of components I'll, I'll talk about in a bit, um, uh, where individuals participate as they do on a lot of our projects, uh, uh, but we are supported by a great community of uh, corporate sponsors as well. I don't think I have the NASCAR slide in here uh, <laughs> that shows the list of them, but uh, it's, uh, it's a mix of um, both the large companies like Google and Visa and Accenture, uh, Gen Digital uh, and Futureway who believe in what we're doing. It's a mix of the companies that are service providers and tools builders for a lot of these kinds of pilots. Um, it involves uh, many of the countries themselves, uh, over 13 different countries who are, uh, uh, you know, have, are participating directly as, as technologists in the project or as advisors, uh, helping us understand where the regulations are going in their, in their um, community. Uh, and it's uh, organizations like EMVCO uh, who uh, coordinate um, a lot of the standards that apply to the payment networks, credit card payments networks out there. Um, our first couple of kind of focus areas have been on verifiable credentials, the, this, this uh, kind of domain I've talked about. But very quickly, when you think about your own wallet, what you have inside it are credit cards, uh, cash, uh, membership documents uh, to different, you know, the zoo, <laughs> uh, maybe your insurance card, right? Uh, you know, here's the, your group number, your policy number, whatever. Uh, all sorts of things that span from payments to assets uh, to, to credentials. And eventually we see uh, the Open Wallet uh, Foundation and the work that we're putting out as falling very much in those, that line. I'll talk a little bit about the components that we've pulled together, um, but I wanted to, to just frame for you uh, kind of the, the longer term picture of where we're heading, which is um, we want to pull, pull these different components together into uh, one or more unified stacks of code. Uh, I, uh, and, and, and this is partly because, look, we're not interested, as much as we talk about like Firefox as an example, or I used Mosaic before when I, I talked, we're not here to ship consumer software. Consumers are hard as a customer base to serve, right? Most Linux Foundation projects serve enterprises, which at least, you know, are, 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 can, you know, assume the risk of what uh, they get into. But delivering software to consumers is something that we, uh, with full respect, uh, uh, is a very hard thing to get right and really does require an organization 
either a for-profit entity like all the ones we know, or nonprofits like Mozilla who do succeed at shipping consumer-grade uh, software, uh, to actually go and, and reach the consumer. In fact, there's this intermediary for mobile software, uh, uh, mobile apps, which is the app stores. And in order to even get apps into the app stores, some of you might have open source projects that are able to put apps in app stores, but you know that it's a very fraught kind of process and you can't exactly disclaim liability and all that kind of stuff. So the big picture of what ultimately we're pulling together are pieces of code that we put into a stack um, uh, that uh, what we uh, uh, hope to see happen, what we, what we are seeing happening, uh, is that um, either companies will take those components, relabel them, maybe set some different parameters, uh, compile them, uh, uh, or a country will do the same thing. Um, I mentioned those 22 member states, uh, but, but there's certainly other countries we've been talking to, um, that those entities will then certify that the code does what they need it to do. Um, they'll put a terms of service on it, which you need to do to put things in the app store. Um, they'll apply there might be a server-side component. Where do the keys get stored? Where is there some sort of, uh, uh, some of the protocols require kind of server-to-server -server communication in this. Um, and then they'll put that in the app stores. Then it gets shipped to the happy dancing people on the right. Um, uh, and so you could call this the Chromium model if you want. You could call this the Linux distributor model. Think of us as like the kernel. Um, but if we do our job right, that uh, green box on the left is 100% of what you need for a minimum viable product in the wallet space. Um, and so what are the types of code that are inside of a wallet? Um, it's pretty, pretty epic. Um, <laughs> it's a lot of different things. It's, uh, it's key management, right? Um, uh, you've, uh, a lot of these protocols hinge on a, a key pair of a, of a public and private key uh, and managing those private keys. I mean, we, our browsers, our mail clients do it kind of invisibly. Uh, I, we want it to do, be something that is a little bit more independent than like a Google account uh, tends to be. So key management, key recovery, those sorts of things become super important. Um, the protocol handling and encryption mechanisms, again, we're, we're talking about 20 years of protocol work that has started to con condense into technologies, uh, standards uh, like the W3C verifiable credential standards, this category of standards called uh, JWT for job of a web token, ironically, but uh, uh, actually uh, uh, they become their own thing, JWTs and SDJOTs for selective disclosure, which is a more privacy preserving form of that. Um, so software that implements those kinds of protocols are super important for us. Um, I, I, things that consumers expect, like they expect to, when they lose their phone, that they're able to like rebuild everything on that phone and not suddenly lose access to the services that, that they need, and that means backup and restore and those sorts of things. Um, uh, a lot of the things here should seem pretty self-explanatory, but it's, um, there's a nuance, uh, it, what, what looks very simple on the outside really ends up being just a lot of safety uh, belt and suspenders work on the backside. And, and, and it needs to be technologies that hinge on national encryption standards that have been certified for use for certain use cases. Uh, it's a pretty large uh, stack at the end of the day that's not unlike what, um, the kind of complexity hidden inside of a web browser uh, or, or a really good mail client. Um, but we, all these pieces need to come together uh, to make this work. Um, and so we've got the start of a set of these, and I'll talk about the specifics pretty soon. Uh, but like every well-run uh, open source umbrella uh, project, uh, like CNCF, like the Hyperledger Foundation, we have a project lifecycle that's intended to uh, make it easy for you know experiments, ideas, kind of the beginnings of good code to come in and develop to projects that uh, can actually you know be something that consumers can use, that companies can feel comfortable pushing to com uh, customers. So. We have a, 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 a you know kind of a process that is governed by our technical advisory council. Uh, younger projects are considered labs. Um, growth stage projects are those that have achieved some degree of deployment, some degree of vetting. Uh, typically, more than one company has been involved with the development by, of it by that point. Uh, and then impact projects are the ones that really are a takeoff and and, and the like. Um, and then finally, like all software has a life cycle. You know, uh, and well run projects I think pretty ruthlessly you know weed out uh, the kind of the moribund projects and. Their, in their in their in their communities, so you have to have an emeritus status, and uh, we're still young. We don't have any there yet, um, but but we're on our way. So um, the two projects that are at the growth stage, uh, uh, sorry, it's a little bit kind of small on the screen, um, are Bifold and Credo. 
And Byfield and Credo are kind of uh, very complementary to each other. They're built by the same team, again, very much funded by the work done in British Columbia uh, for their use cases. Some of you might even have this app on your phone. <laughs> uh, I, I, and uh, if, you're, if you, uh, uh, you know, visit British Columbia a lot or, or do business there or a citizen there, um, you'll probably have this app now or, or pretty soon. Um, and uh, they're, they're kind of two halves that implement uh, both a set of early standards that were part of uh, um, the uh, uh, a part of the experiments uh, and the early pilots they were doing around a standard called a non-creds, uh, and then uh, 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 that was that, that was the work of Credo, and then Bifold added to that support for some of the W3C verifiable credentials, um, and both of these are full wallet stacks. Um, I mean, combined together, it's a full wallet stack with the end user experience and that sort of thing. Um, the labs projects that we have, uh, most of them are more specific to protocol handlers and handlers for different kinds of verifiable credentials and then implemented in specific languages um, like Python and Kotlin uh, and uh, uh, um, Swift, obviously, for, for, uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the iOS ecosystem. Um, one of the interesting components on here is something that uh, it's the Android identity library. It's simply just been, uh, actually, I should have updated this. Uh, it's, it's it's just called identity creds right now. Um, this is code that was contributed by Google, um, authored to be so, uh, a part of the Google wallet that would handle verifiable credentials. They said, this is non-differentiating for us. We want to see everybody adopt the same set of standards so that you can take these credentials and load them into Google Wallet. None of this is organized, by the way, as an anti-Google or anti-Apple project. Google is, in fact, a premier member. Um, uh, but what, So what they said is they, they believe enough in the mission. They want to see enough standardized adoption that they felt, hey, if we can offer this in and accelerate adoption by doing this, that would be great. So the Android Identity Library uh, came in and it was immediately picked up by the team that was building the reference implementation for the European Commission um, uh, and is now part of the reference wallet that they've published on the European Union's um, GitHub uh, organization. Uh, I, and, and, and so this kind of round tripping is like already some real value that we've cre created, even though it seems very nerdy, <laughs> um, but as evidence that we can be a, a critical part of the glue that helps connect the public policymakers and, and folks who are building the software, uh, it's, it was, it's, it's an amazing proof point. It's small, it's a tiny signal, but we hope to be doing dozens and dozens of these kinds of things, perhaps even larger pieces of software over the course of time. Um, uh, we've also been a home for, there's a, there's a quiet project called the, the Farm Worker Wallet OS, which is um, something that, again, we're an open shop, anybody can propose a project. This was something that was about creating uh, digital wallets for uh, um, farm workers in a low resource environment um, uh, to help them track uh, some basic information about, about their work status. Um, this was something that hasn't had a lot of traction, but as a place where I think we can create a, um, uh, something that can create value for uh, in, in terms of inclusiveness, in terms of making sure this technology reaches uh, um, all sorts of different players and not just the, the, the high status elites. Um, uh, it's important, it was really reassuring to me to see that project in there and, and see it creating value for a set of participants. Um, uh, and I'm certainly, you know, we certainly are looking at projects and, and working on things now with um, uh, groups in, in uh, India, groups in Africa, um, looking at how this might actually help with a lot of cross-border needs in the other low resource environments. And so I'm really happy to have there as an example of what more we can do. Um, so uh, the rest of this is really just how we as a community work, because I, I, you know, nothing matters at all in this project unless we're shipping code, unless we're a, a home for contributors, not just from our members, not just from the kinds of orgs that support us. And we can have all the best kind of messaging from uh, politicians around the world, but it doesn't really matter unless we're shipping code. So we have, uh, uh, a, in addition to the technical projects, we have two kinds of other containers for work. Um, and the first is uh, what we call today a special interest group. And this is really how we try to organize um, uh, cross-cutting issues across our projects, right? So on the topic of architecture, what, what is the ideal way for us to weave these different components together? Um, how do they do it today? And how do we evolve them so it's easier for new components to come in, support for newer protocols and, 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 and credential formats uh, uh, and, 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 and the like? So there's a SIG, for example, on architecture that, that works on that. There's another SIG that's called the Safe Wallet SIG, which is 
you know, wallets will vary based on the degree of privacy that they, they offer their end users, vary to the degree of uh, uh, safety. Safety is a very broad term. And there are a lot of our participants who felt it was important to have a rubric, a framework for understanding how to express this in a way that um, unifies the terminology across the wallets that are inside of, uh, that, uh, that we, are, we are producing, the wallet software pr we're producing. If other groups find that useful, um, then they're welcome to that. Uh, but the SIG is primarily focused on how do we advance um, certain areas related to our software. And then the task forces are just more time limited. Like, let's go investigate this domain. Let's see if there's a gap in something. Let's put together a team and go and tackle it. So um, uh, happy to, you know, this, this deck, I'm happy to obviously upload to the website when this is available. Uh, as I mentioned, we have one on architecture, one on safe wallets. Uh, we also have two that are focused on kind of developing a landscape of the credential formats that are out there, as well as a landscape of the existing third-party wallets, like, like what are the features that they provide, what, are, what would be a minimum viable kind of solution to them, partly to go and recruit those wallets to become based on the code uh, uh, that is being developed at the Open Wallet Foundation. Um, uh, <laughs> our outputs are pretty nerdy, right? And, and ultimately, there's code, uh, but also from our communities. It's, it's a lot of the knowledge that we're trying to organize that, frankly, hasn't been put together before uh, in any other existing open source project. Um, with that, you know, we use a lot of the same standard tools that open source developers are comfortable with, GitHub, uh, mailing lists. You know. This community, more than any other I've been a part of in the past, it really does a lot of its work on Discord. Uh, I feel like a dinosaur every time I use Discord. I was just getting used to Slack. Uh, uh, um, so, so to have something thrown up by the gamer community as like a collaboration platform is interesting. Uh, but, uh, but, it, but it is where a lot of the more incidental conversations take place and, and, uh, and really the heart of a lot of the community. Um, but we also have a well-maintained community calendar. And once every two weeks, our technical advisory council uh, has a call. In fact, the next Next one is tomorrow morning, um, uh, just to talk about new projects that come in and what the, are the internal uh, standards, so to speak, that we should adopt for, for how our projects work. Um, this is the NASCAR slide uh, uh, that talks about who our supporters are uh, in, in the organization, the countries that have been involved to date, um, uh, which include uh, countries like Switzerland and the UK, the United States, uh, um, uh, Brazil we recently added. In fact, this is an old slide. Daniel's probably looking at this kind of wincing, going, oh, they, they were missing a couple of there. Um, uh, and China. Uh, you know, we believe what we're building it needs to be as global as the internet is today. Um, it needs to involve countries that, that have not really been participating in the open source community as much, perhaps, as they could. Um, I, that every country you can place a phone call to today should be able to be, you should be able to be exchanging uh, credentials with and engaging in business using a common standard uh, we take, we, we believe. And so it's great to have that level of participation. We're thinking about ways to plug that into other international organizations uh, in the way that they work going forward as well. But it would be meaningless if we weren't also in actually shipping code and involving developers, both from these organizations that are sponsors, uh, but also even a larger set. A lot of contributors don't even work for any of these. These are the companies, though, that allow us to do our work uh, to make this happen. Um, and with that, I mean, I can go into a bit more detail than, than perhaps is interesting, but I really wanted to get across the, the conceptual frame for what we're doing, um, uh, get across that we've got live projects that are creating value out there, uh, and get across that we are an open source, uh, a truly open source community, and we really would love to see more participation here. And this is a domain where, I mean, per line of code, I think you could have more positive impact on the world than most open source projects, um, because this is about, <laughs> Everyone has their favorite sci-fi movie, um, uh, perhaps, or their fav favorite depiction of dystopia, right? Maybe it's uh, Blade Runner or something else. Mine was the movie Brazil. Did anyone see the movie Brazil? Um, so it's a comedy. It's Terry Gilliam. It was part of the Monty Python thing. But part of the dystopia of Brazil is citizens getting buried in paperwork. Um, in fact, one of the heroes is a character played by Robert De Niro. I forget his character name. Somebody can look it up. Who plays an underground plumber? Who, when you have a plumbing problem or with your or a duct problem, um, you can call the uh, certified official, like like uh, uh, government associated plumbers or duct fixers. But they take forever and they're corrupt. And this guy like swings in literally on a on a something like Spider Man would, you know, and comes in and quiet gets in, gets out really quietly in the middle of the night, fixes your plumbing, fixes your ducts, and just for whatever tips you want, and then is off, right? And so this idea 
I think it's a much more likely uh, 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 dystopian future scenario that we end up just being buried in in, in meaningless paperwork and in, in, in processes that are not transparent and not digital and not efficient. And this project is, I think, one of the few that, that is going to make a dent in keeping that kind of dystopia from happening. Um, the second thing that excites me about this is, you know, a lot of us are concerned about the rise of AI, rise of misinformation, the rise of deep fakes. I think we're going to see that this era where stuff that we publish to the internet um, anonymously without a signature, uh, uh, without much except the domain name that it's perhaps attached to, will gradually give way to a world where uh, digital content is almost always signed. Some of you might use a, a camera today from Sony or Leica that digitally signs those photos using the key from those cameras um, that's verified using, I forget, what's the standard? Uh, C2PA, C2PA, um, uh, which is great. Uh, the next step is that content being auto-signed with a photographer's uh, signature as well. Um, or the content you publish on a blog or, or on a social media network also getting signed with your keys. And we don't get there unless we have a really efficient way for people to be able to, um, in a more solid way than we have today, attest to who they are and attach that attestation to a piece of content, a signature to a content, and push that out there. And I think wallets, portable wallets that are, are centered on the individual rather than simply a part of a social network you're a part of um, are a key to making that, that happen. So in the fight against disinformation and deep fakes, I think we're really critical. There's probably all sorts of other ways this project will save the world, but I'm, I'm running out of time. So with that, any uh, questions? Any ideas, any comments? Who else here is already involved in the project, by the way? Oh, great. So that's Keith, that's Daniel. Um, uh, uh, great. Well, all of you are brand new uh, uh, contributors then to the project. I can't wait to see your first pull request. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like this? <laughs> all right. Give me a second here. Uh, of course, where, where do I post this and where do I sign it? It would be <laughs> other questions. Uh, come on, Google. All right. Smile. OK. All right, um, I'll post that somewhere. Uh, yes, question. What more is it happening for synchronization of wallets? Mm. Mobility. Work that's happening around synchronization and mobility of wallets. So. Uh, uh, on the synchronization side, um, I think there will be obviously the, the built-in wallets today to, to, to you know the operating systems synchronized with your Google account to your Apple ID. All right, third-party wallets as they come in will have a choice. Um, uh, do you want to back it up to the to the way that other apps on a phone back, get get their data backed up? Do you want to attach uh, uh, it to the hardware device? A lot of these will talk to uh, trusted uh, like enclaves on the phone and store keys that way or, or store a part of the key uh, on the local secure hardware. In fact, that's a big topic in this, in this community is how do we make sense of the wild west of security, secure hardware on the Android ecosystem. Um, it's a little bit better on the Apple one. Um, but I think we're going to see the rise of uh, um, di uh, digital identity um, fiduciaries. Basically, entities that you'll pick um, uh, that will be the place that you store private keys associated with your assets, with your credentials, or otherwise, that look a little bit like, you know, Tim Berners-Lee with Solid and Interrupt is starting to do a bit of this, right? Um, uh, encrypted, you could certainly store this in a lot of different places, but um, I think uh, getting us out of the belief that we have to tie it to just one or two of the cloud providers is, is going to be an important thing. Certainly there's countries that want to step into that as well, which gives me a little bit of pause, right? Um, some of you may know about, uh, 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 in India, the Aadhaar system, which is a, the government-run national ID system, which they're extending with a bunch of different stuff, but it does kind of center the Indian government a bit too much in where, um, in the synchronization between all that data and the storage of all that data. Something more independent, something that gives you freedom of choice is really where we need to head. That's my personal take, um, but I do think that's aligned with where a lot of the protocols are heading as well, uh, to have your choice of who your identity uh, provider is and who's attesting to things about you, but then a separate choice as to where I store those credentials and, and that, those really important digital assets, basically. Um, that's the synchronization bit. What was the second bit? Uh, and, and what do you mean by mobility? So I have multiple wallets. Um, I see. 
Yeah, okay, it's the same, 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 po same point, yeah. Definitely, if, you know, most people have more than one phone at this point, um, I bet in this room, uh, you certainly have your desktop. You do want unified kind of credentials across all these. That is something like Mozilla accounts provides. Like I use Firefox on, on both the phone and, and the desktop, and not only is my, like, are my passwords for websites synchronized, I've noticed even my browsing history is synchronized, so I can use the magic bar on one and remember to go to the other, right? So um, uh, I think we'll see different ways to weave these together. Um, uh, but the important thing is consumer choice in that front, rather than being forced to use what your platform provider gives. Yes. Sorry. Now you're looking at my calendar. If you're curious, uh, oh, go ahead. Where did it go? Ah, okay. Uh huh. So I would like to upgrade my device, and I would like to make sure that my home device I share all the resources, like all the wireless. Not directly. I think that's something more the platform, uh, your your phone platforms would handle. You know, wipe my device, uh, kind of thing. Obviously, being able to. Um, migrate your data uh, from a wallet on one phone to a wallet on another is the synchronization question. Um, but I think I, I, you know, there's print more uh, uh, basic things, functions on a phone uh, so that when you sell it or give it to somebody or you turn it in for uh, um, a credit for a new phone, there's always like a wipe my phone kind of function, or reset my phone. Oh, right, um, and do some sort of secure delete uh, where it writes over the space a couple times or something. Um, I, that's not something I know of in any of the wallets that we have, uh, uh, but uh, it would be a good idea, yeah. Yes? Uh, how much time with the hardware models to sit on top of? Yeah. Yes. So that's that's uh, the uh, part I was started. To, I just covered very very lightweight, and uh, when I talked about secure hardware and the security functions, with the secure enclaves that are in a lot of phones, um, Apple has a relatively clean and standardized way to access those. The problem is um, apps that try to talk to those in ways that are more sophisticated than just, you know, get a key, store a key. Um, uh, Apple holds the reins pretty tightly on how those phones behave, and it makes it hard to innovate in that domain. Um, uh, so there's some conversations and some pressure and some other things we have to do to get that to be what we want. Um, on the Android side, there's a very wide spectrum from uh, uh, phones from Samsung and Google that have very sophisticated uh, trusted enclaves uh, and lots of flexibility with how to program them to phones that have no secure hardware because they're $25 phones designed for uh, low resource environments for the developing world. Um, uh, and so uh, the developers do have to figure out how to work with these uh, and, and not fall back to storing keys and clear text on a phone as like the, the, the only option. Um, we, we need a more nuanced uh, approach than we have today, I'll be honest about that, uh, to be able to really implement that. We kind of leave that as an exercise to the developer, and I think over time we'll have a more sophisticated answer to that. So if you have expertise in this domain, I'd love to talk with you about how to involve you in uh, uh, both the implementation side of that or even just kind of like how do we get policymakers to, to engage in the right way with the hardware makers to figure out what the story should really look like. Daniel's uh, smiling because you know, he and I talk about this a lot. <laughs> Daniel, by the way, is the executive director of the Open Wallet Foundation. So uh, he and I work together on this project. Great. Well, I think. Okay. Well, with that, um, uh, Daniel and I will be around for a little bit longer, uh, although we have to fly tomorrow, to, tonight or tomorrow down to the Internet Identity Workshop, which is where the nerds in the identity space get together. It just kind of was bad timing that it happened both the same week. But um, catch us just after uh, this session if you want to keep talking. So thank you.